that's some that's some sound. <laughs> yeah. It it's showing that you you got something serious going on. going on what what is going on right now all right so we just pulled up very nondescript location just a, a standard suburbia home and this gentleman Pete who is a legendary racing driver car collector has opened up his place for us and he pulled out his Honka right now we're we're just getting a couple shots of it we got a 400 hour tribute car park here we all hold. oh look 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 <laughs> Yeah, yeah. Amazing. Look at that. Airlift on a Hako. Have you ever seen this? Have you ever seen this? I've never seen this. Definitely not, sir. Yeah, I, I already knew this was special when I saw this at GTR Fest. But, you know, there's just so much noise at an event like that. There's just so much going on. It's, it's almost hard to concentrate, you know, so. To be able to see this just by itself, and the sound and the smell, and the textures, the color, just beautiful. <laughs> Do I need a, a cap to cover no, the... No, 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 you're, no good. you're all good. <laughs> I just, I don't even, I don't really know where to begin. I, I'm so shocked. I, I'm just so happy also that a collection like this exists and of course, you being the curator of this incredible collection. And then we have your beautiful Hako here that I actually had a chance to see briefly at GTR Fest. But seeing it out here in the light, you know, slammed to the ground, mm. this is so incredible. Yeah, well, uh, as I mentioned, I, I went to Japan first uh, in 1971 when I was 21 which was pretty rare for Australians in those days because they tended to go to Europe. But uh, I'd studied Japanese at uni and I thought, okay, I'm going to go and live in Japan for a while. And in those days, believe it or not, walking around Tokyo, people actually looked at you because you were an oddity, uh, which seems ludicrous now. But the intriguing thing was that the Hakko came out in 1969, the four-door, and they went racing with it and uh, were successful. I think they won 30-odd uh, races, but in order to take weight out, they uh, then developed the, the uh, two-door, and uh, that made it more nimble. And between the four-door and the two-door, they won 50 races. And you can imagine this is, um, well, there's a pr prior history with Prince in the 60s, but all that technology went into Nissan. Anyway, long story short, this car came out the month that I arrived. And so, you know, as a 21-year-old, that was hugely influential particularly compared to the cars that we could get in Australia. Can I just stop you for a yeah. moment and just talk about how <laughs> awesome your shoes are? I can't believe you have Fuji yeah. or a Tofu shop. Yeah, that's right. Shoes, like from Initial D. You're just a fan of cars. You're a fan of JDM cars. Like, what led you to this point? I know you have been racing for a long time. Like, mm. just tell us a little bit about yourself. Well... <sighs> Wow, I, I, I don't want to bore you, Larry. But, no, no, uh, no, not boring at all. This is incredible. I got, I'll make, make it as brief as I can, but uh, when I was 14, I, I actually started studying Chinese at, at school. Why did I take up a Chinese? Because it, it sounded like a novel thing to do. When I went to uni, I took up Japanese. Why did I do that? It sounded like a nice thing to do. My Chinese at the time was actually better than my Japanese, but you couldn't go to China. I could have gone to Taiwan, but I'd actually made some Japanese friends in Australia. So I was like, oh, I'm going to go to Japan. So I jumped on a ship. I couldn't afford the airfare at the time. I jumped on a ship, a five-week trip, went to Japan. 
arrived there with a suitcase when I was 21. Spent 12 months there and that was just sort of a, a total game changer. Fell in love with the place. It wasn't just the cars. I mean, the, so many things were happening in Japan. Audio, cars, cameras, you, you'd know. I mean, some very significant things were happening. But, you know, the, the culture, the food, you name it. So fell in love with it. And that, that so that decision at 14 sort of led to that. And then when I came back to Australia, ultimately, I thought I'd better do something serious. So I started to work for a Japanese company, door knocked until they gave me a job. Started working for a trading company, figured out that I'd rather be in a small, uh, a big cog in a small machine than a small cog in a big machine. So I started with my wife-to-be, we weren't married, but uh, a Japanese girl who uh, had come to Australia. We, uh, we started a, a jazz a cafe in Melbourne in 1973. Modelled on what's happening in Japan, there's uh, jazz cafes in Japan called Jazz Kissa, and it's, it's for the love of jazz by the Japanese. So. I'd been inspired by one that I went to in Shinjuku called Lefties. We called ours Lefties. We played jazz. We had a high-end sound system. So the whole Japanese theme, in fact, has continued through my life. We, I'm, my wife's Japanese. We go to Japan regularly. Cars are just part of that love. Yeah. So you're fluent in Japanese. I can speak Japanese, yeah. And it helps for you to source parts, buy cars, buy cars enjoy yeah. Going to Japan? Yeah. Race in Japan? No, never raced in Japan. No, unfortunately. I, I, I was a late starter. I, I started in Australia when I was 42 and raced and rallied for 20 years like a man possessed, Yeah, but gave up when I was 62. But yeah, had had quite successes, uh, circuit racing and uh, tarmac rallying. Yeah, won, won quite a few races of... You haven't seen it yet, but there's a few few uh, bits of tin and plastic trophies upstairs. <laughs> yeah, I want to check that out. But yeah. can we just do a quick walk around with yeah. this? So where did you actually purchase this? Did you actually get this in Japan? Yeah, so I, I decided, I mean, uh, Hacker was always, you know, up up there on, on the list to try and try and find one. It took 18 months to, I, I was, you know, uh, sourcing Hacker as I, I could find plenty of them, but the real problem is they all have rust. The um, secret is to try and find one with the least amount of rust. That took 18 months. And this one was relatively good, still had rust. I uh, brought it out to Australia, shipped it straight to a, a guy uh, who done the restos for me in Queensland, bare metal restoration, cut out all the rust, and he turned it around in about nine months. I got it back, but the motor I sourced here, it's a race motor, it, it has 300 horsepower at the rear wheels, so it's probably about 400 at the engine, which is pretty good for a, uh, what was a 2.8? It's a 3.1 board and stroke. Um, the interior is bespoke. Yeah, so this, uh, you, you just heard it, Larry, being started from coal, and you can see no choke, it's not cranky, it idles pretty quickly. Lovely motor, just amazing. So I had no, no, no problems with it. Anyway, after the nine months, I got it back, but there was probably another 12 months of fettling. I, I uh, initially uh, put on um, coilovers, but I wanted to get the stance and decided I had to go to, um, to um, bags. So I started inquiring in, in America and so on and so forth. Came up with a, um, something I thought would, would work, and we actually fitted up the bags down there in the shed in the host over a period of time. And yeah, it's, it's not only gives you the stance, but the ride quality is fantastic. Have you driven at Scuba? No, I've been there uh, several times. Been to most of the Japanese tracks, race meetings, but said never, unfortunately left my run too late. I guess I would have liked to, you know, race in Europe as well, but uh, that didn't happen. Oh, well, for that matter, the States. But no, all, all my racing was done here. This is just so clean. I mean, it's like a brand new vehicle. Well, these seats are, you know, they're Recaros, but they, they, I found them in Japan. Somebody's doing the old Japanese race system. Uh, system, you know, for the seats. So I bought those, had them initially just sort of checked into the car to bring it out here. But the problem was the rears because it had the rear, you know, the original oh. seats. So I located the eyelets and then got, got an upholsterer to copy the style and I, it came out way better than I expected. Really? Yeah. It matches really nice. Yeah. I've got to, I've got to show you the... Um, I'll show you the trunk as well, uh, Larry, because that's, mm -hmm. uh, that's the business end of the, of the bags. <laughs> You know what really is is so cool to me is that you actually drive this vehicle. Yeah, I do. Um, you know, people are amazed, but um, I yeah, I've always thought you know, I mean, the largest part of, of cars is, is actually driving them and, and enjoying it and the camaraderie, you know, with uh, going out on cruises or uh, you know, I've, I've done four hundred k cruise with this thing. As you know, I, I drove it to World Time Attack yesterday, drove it back. Bit painful at night because I got to unscrew the headlight covers and you know put them back and. 
There's, there's also one trick that caught me out is when you slam it down, you've got to have the wheel straight because if you have them crooked, <laughs> you end up with all sorts of problems as you can imagine. So yeah, yeah, I learned that the hard way. So oh wow. So 100 litre fuel tank, which the race cars had, obviously the uh, tank for the bags, the compressors, two compressors sit in the wheel well. It really is brand new inside and out. It's so yeah, clean. Yeah, but it's, it's been used now for uh, five years. What uh, is the original color? Original, well, <laughs> when it came from Japan, it was white. But when we scraped off all the paint, there was probably just about every color. I think we saw black, we saw silver, we didn't see yellow. But I, I, wanted, I wanted yellow, but to get the right yellow, a painter actually said yellow is the next most difficult color to white when you want a particular look. You know, you think white would be simple, but there's so many shades of white, and that's what we found. So I had, I picked out 30 different shades of yellow, narrowed it finally down to two, and chose this one. And I think it's, uh, yeah, it's, it's kind of in your face, but it's also kind of 70s. It's not too modern. And, um... It's so cool. It, I mean, it just reminds me of what the race cars were back when, but now this is like a street going version. Now, what, what can I say? I, you know, when I look at it now, I guess it's based on my 50 odd years of exposure to Japan. Uh, you know, I, you, as you say, you see the race cars, you, you see the, uh, the, you know, the, the uh, cars that are rock hard, throwing out sparks, uh, you know, running on the road. Most of the Japanese cars that are, look anything like this are, are, are very rough. Uh, still full of rust. None of them tend to go the whole way. But I like my cars to look nice and you know be be as you know as good as they can be. But at the same time, use them too. Amazing. Can we take a look at some of the, your cars yeah. in your collection? Yep. I I just love that you drive all your cars, and I love that you have a very. It, it seems like you have a pretty focused collection mm. of, of just things that you love to drive. I suppose one of the really important things is, is the driving aspect of the car. You know, whilst that's quite highly modified, I, I can say it's got modern features, but you can't take an old car out of the old car. So it's cantankerous, it's, it's cold in winter, it's hot in summer. It's not the most enjoyable driver's car. On the other hand, if you look around at that NSX, of the, say, uh, pre-2000 cars, that's my favourite car to drive. It's just a magical car in every respect. Um, as you know, they're not hugely fast, but the, the uh, you know some of the fast cars are, are too you know too fast. Particularly in Australia, we don't have very good roads. You you just can't exploit them. But with the NSX, uh, you, you can get a lot of enjoyment um, in all respects. And this one didn't come with power steering either. No, that hasn't got power steering. I'm the third owner of the car. It's a uh, it's a 92 uh, NA1 NSX. Only done uh, 25,000 miles. So. I'll probably, well, I don't know how many I'll do, but I've, I've you know, had it out. It's, it's absolutely standard. I put the wheels on, I put a cat-back exhaust, but I have all the original parts, so it could go back to the original. Yeah, just a, a beautiful, beautiful. So you, you're a motorcycle enthusiast too. Yeah, so I've got to start at that end, which is a, that's a CB750 Ford. Um, this, this was the bike, this came out in about 67 or 68. And this was a bike that signaled the end of the UK bike industry because this was just inconceivable. Four inline cylinders, disc brakes, electric starter, didn't leak oil, went hard. It was, and, and it was relatively cheap. So when I went to Japan, I mean, I, I knew of them. There's probably a trickle coming into Australia in 71, but not many. So when I went to Japan, uh, my first bike, like, it was actually lent to me by uh, Japanese friends, was a monkey bike, you know, the little monkey, small bikes. And we, we used to ride around Tokyo on that, it looked quite crazy. Anyway, I thought, I, I want to get one of these um, 750s. So I bought a, uh, a, a 69 750 and I, I brought it uh, back to Australia with me. Went back in 74 and bought another one, bought that back. So the 754 is really dear to my heart there. Fantastic bike. At the time, Kawasaki were also developing a 754, but Honda got the jump on them. So Kawasaki said, okay, go back to the drawing board. We need to bring out something that's going to be better than the Honda. So that was that bike. That's the Z1 Kawasaki. And that, that, um, that came out in 74. This is a 74 bike delivered to Australia. And the key feature there is it's 900cc and, and twin overhead cam, as you can see. Now, one of these bikes in the States recently sold for 55,000 US. And I reckon, well, I mean, it, that was an immaculate bike, but this is pretty damn good too. So I don't know, maybe 40,000 US, you know, for this. So uh, that was Kawasaki's answer. 
So Honda, Honda lost the plot a little bit during the 70s, and US Honda said to Japan Honda, hey, you know, give us something new, you know, we, 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 we're getting beaten here. So the, uh, the Japanese said, right, we've got something for you. Wait, we're coming over to the States, we're gonna, we're gonna show you. And that bike was this one, which is called the CBX 1000. Six cylinders, 110 horsepower. This sounds like, particularly with these pipes, these standard pipes are three, three into uh, one on each side, so just single pipes out either other side. These pipes are actually Australian, but sold world, worldwide. That sounds like a, a Ferrari on, on, on song. A remarkable bike, uh, you know, for the year. It's just set. so crazy to me that it's an individual yeah, yeah. exhaust for yeah. each. Have a look at the engine when you, when you go up there, there's six pipes up there. <laughs> what, what's crazy to me, is how wide this is. Yeah, yeah. Like, it, it's just so much wider than the rest of the bike. Yeah. Well, back back in the day, I, I, I've got a photo somewhere that I took of the, the 750, like low down with the pipes, of, you know, four pipes sticking out. And I thought, man, how, how wide is that tire? You look at it now, I mean, it's just a joke that <laughs> compared to, this is a modern bike, I mean, they're just skinny little tires and yeah. a lot of horsepower. But um, yeah, fun, fun to ride. Now, this is the only modern one here. Uh, this is a couple of years old, and this was bought out as a, um, as a tribute uh, to this. And I don't know if it's worldwide, but that color is called the Jaffa color, the orange color. And as you can see, this was brought out. This was the, the, the sought after color. Um, they did come in other colors, but uh, this is a, a modern version with fuel injection. Strangely, um, from factory, they came uh, out with uh, four into one pipe. But I sourced these from Delkovic in America and uh, put them on, and I, I just think it looks so much better. It looks like the, uh, you know, the older brother. Yeah. That's... So that's that's the story with that one. There's a one down there called the Kawasaki H2. That's a triple cylinder two stroke. It was known as the Widowmaker because it was the fastest road bike. I think the standing quarter mile was 12 seconds out of the box, and they'd sort of do wheel stands in most gears. But the problem was they were great in a straight line, but couldn't go around corners or stop. So hence the Widowmaker. You have a lot of these old Japanese signs yeah, too, yeah. huh? Yeah, I don't know how it is in the States, but here, old enamel signs, you know, anything auto-related uh, are, are crazy prices. And um, you can buy these on, online, you know, like you know, Yahoo or whatever. So I started collecting them because they're not auto-related, but they're, they're all sorts of different related. I mean, I'll tell you some of them, but I just think they look great. Wait, so you read and write Japanese also? Can read to a certain extent, uh, can write uh, to a certain extent, but I can speak a lot better than both. Both. I, I got sort of lazy. I, uh, I, I was motivated to be able to speak Japanese, to be able to communicate and, you know, get, get on the same uh, mental wavelength, if you like. And I used to do a lot of business in Japan and going back and forth and uh, involving sales. So if you didn't speak, as, as you probably know, a lot of Japanese don't speak, younger people maybe, but older people don't speak English. So, you know, if you want to communicate, uh, particularly, you know, get on the same wavelength, you, you've got to know the language. So, yeah, yeah, 100%. Yeah. Next to it, you have the Godzilla, Darth Vader. Darth Vader, yeah, well, I, I just looked at it and thought, well, you know, it looks like Darth Vader, so <laughs> uh, I got the plates. Um, this is a newer one too. This yeah, is like the later generation. 2016. It's called the Premium, only done 11,000 kilometers. Great car. I, uh, I don't know if you... Yeah, I love this so much. <laughs> this is so funny. Do you have those stick figures? In yeah, the yeah, we do, yeah. yeah. It's so yeah. good. <laughs> I, uh, just by the by, the, these pictures on the wall are, are largely, when I was racing, I, I used to represent Lotus, uh, so that was having an off, but um, yeah, I won the sports car championship in, the, in that car in 2001. Um, the plates here are all the Targa, uh, which was a tarmac rally in Tasmania that I did. Cannibal Run, you may have heard of. That was a, yeah. Yeah, a couple of guys uh, from Japan uh, were, were, were killed in an F40 uh, and they crashed into a, um, uh, a checkpoint and killed the two officials. So four people died and as a result, the, uh, the whole event was you know, downgraded, which was and never run again. This, this one's an interesting story. This one's left-hand drive. Yeah, this, is from, this originally is from the States. So thanks to the internet, I've actually been able to trace most of the prior ownership. So I don't know where I start. I bought the car out of Budapest in Hungary. <laughs> <laughs> and um, the, the, I, I, you know, I've done a few restorations and I just wanted to avoid restorations. I just wanted to get cars that were nicely presented, jump in and drive. I couldn't find what I wanted in Australia, so I started looking around. 
and I saw this advertising in an English car magazine with a Hungarian number, uh, telephone number, and um, I thought, okay, they must speak English, so I rang them up. Uh, long story short, there's a, it's become very famous now, but there's a, uh, a restoration shop in Budapest that only does Zs, and they now call themselves S20 World. At the time, it was called Datsun Club Hungary. This was the 13th car that they restored, but I traced it back from there. So the car started in Arizona. Uh, it was sold to a guy in Colorado who I'm in touch with. Um, and I don't know, uh, I don't think you'd mind me saying, but he contacted recently, recently and said, would I sell it back to him? <laughs> so, yeah, so from Colorado, he sold it to a guy in New Hampshire. It was sold to a guy in Italy uh, who sent it to this uh, restorer in Budapest. And uh, it was always a pretty good car. But this, this shop in Budapest was, you know, right back everything. And the colour is original, original motor, original interior. So white with a blue interior is quite unusual. Can we take a look at the engine? You certainly can. Uh, this actually appeared in the, um, in the Budapest Motor Show. They did delivery like this, uh, which is a, a tribute, obviously, to uh, BRE racing in the States. Yeah. Yeah. Our, our Pete Rock. Yeah, your yeah, 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 yeah. 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 So it is so clean. Yeah, this I, this to me is you know the epitome. I mean, the Hacko has a nice resto, but this is just this is just magical quality everywhere. You know, all, all the all the clamps are the you know the right the right. Uh, Does the light work? Yeah. Oh. yeah. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so the only thing, and I've got the originals, but it, it came with these Weber carvings, which you know gives it a little bit more performance. It's got like the four three two you know uh, exhaust at the back. Yeah. Um, other than that, so that's actually the original 2.4-litre two, uh, 2 motor, four-speed gearbox, which, you know, you, you guys had in the States, we had five-speed. But it, it, this, this, for an old car, actually drives pretty much like, well, you know, pretty, it feels like a new, pretty a newish car. Yeah, it's, it's amazing. Great car to drive. Amazing. <laughs> it's, it's crazy because we're, what, 20 minutes into our interview and we haven't, there's just so many other amazing vehicles to touch on. Let, let's talk about your newest vehicle. Yeah. GR Yaris. Yeah. So why this? You know, I go back to the element of driver's car. When it was announced, uh, you know, you, you, I knew straight away. I probably got to go back one step um, to the 22B, which you, you'd be aware of. Um, Australia was a luck, lucky enough to get five 22Bs back in 1998 or 99. I got one of those cars at the time. The uh, Subaru Australia kept one, another dealer kept one, and there were only three private owners. I mean, I knew they were they were rare, uh, obviously, uh, but I loved that car so much. Uh, I used that as my daily car. I, I, I had it new and I did 45,000 Ks. It was my daily. And, and coincidentally, this today, I, I, I can show you, but, on Instagram, a guy that I used to do a little bit of driving instruction with, uh, he published a picture of my car, the 22B, and I had the number plate 22B. He published it today, and he said, this shot was taken 20 years ago today, September the 3rd. Anyway, I say that because I like that kind of car. That was a magic car. I use it every day. Uh, hence, I mean, I made a, a major mistake selling it, but, you know, you sell things to buy other things. And uh, so... It was one of the reasons that I, I got the Tommy Mackinnon down there. Um, mm. it's, a, it's just as nice a car to drive. All, all the same sort of attributes. Slightly different in, in some respects. But that's the kind of car I like to drive. I mean, they, they're, they're phenomenal despite, you know, being 30-odd uh, years old. So, obviously, when Toyota bring out something, you know it's going to be the modern-day Tommy Mack or the modern-day 22B. Yeah, it's a, it's a play on... Obviously, it grips, but it, it's also GR. So. Ah, <laughs> yeah, I like how tricky! <laughs> I love that. So then, these are, this these is are this is a special model too, right? Yeah, this, this is, is like this is the this is the uh, one that's got the uh, the the two diffs. It's um, it's got the lightweight wheels. Yeah, there's a whole lot of features. So the the lesser one was about. 52,000 Australian dollars, and this was about 62,000. A few people say, wow, that's, that's expensive, um, but I, I think it's great, great value. I mean, you, you know, a, a, Tommy, a Tommy Mac would cost you probably, for anything that's decent, that's probably 80, 85,000. So to be able to buy a new car with modern technology. But this is the homologation special now yeah. of, of the modern era. Yeah, yeah, numbered, yeah. numbered for what it's worth. This is number 394, it's a little tag inside. And yeah, this, this is my modern day 22B. <laughs> so neat. And then this is a good transition to yeah, this yeah. 
race car that you have just hanging <laughs> from your ceiling here. Yeah, well, I had to put it somewhere. I was running out of space. Um, that I imported that from the States. That's an interesting story. I'll try and keep it short. But that's a 1970, uh, uh, 1972 March, 729. And there was an American guy called Wayne Mitchell who was racing in, the, in Europe. March were occupied with um, uh, Formula 2 and Formula 1. And Wayne was heading back to the States. So they said to Wayne, look, could you represent us in the States? He said, yeah, sure. So uh, what happened was that March supplied most of the parts to Wayne. This is the very first car that he built uh, there, so in 7291. But there are certain parts that he added, like the steering rack has got his label on the steering rack. There's only 11, 11 of them ever made, and that was the first one. There were, uh, there were I think, two built actually in England, and then the other uh, nine, if you like, were built in the States. Have you driven this yeah, vehicle? Yeah, yeah, yeah I, I don't have the pictures here, but yeah, I, I actually got it for my son to race, and he did some sprints, but I actually did a race meeting with a car. It's a heap of fun. It's, it's race worthy. I mean, it'd have to be recommissioned now, but it, it's, it's basically race worthy. So when you put it up like that, did you just take all the fluids out? What yeah. did you do? Yeah, yeah, I had to take all the fluids out, and then uh, I, had a, I had a friend, we took the nose cone off, that comes off pretty easily, and we were the block and tackle up there. So I, I held it out, and he, he pulled it up, and as it pulled out, it pulled the nose in, and then, of course, put the nose back on. And then he clambered up there because I was a bit nervous and we put an extra loop on there. And, you know, for quite a long time, I was really reluctant to bug any car under here. But <laughs> it's been up there for well, uh, yeah, maybe four years now. It hasn't, so. it hasn't fallen yet. So. Not yet. Do you want to stand over here? <laughs> <laughs> what, a, what a display piece. So yeah. do you think you'll ever drive it again? Uh, I won't. My, 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 my son says, you know, we should take it down and drive it. But, um, yeah, my, my racing days are over. Uh, but you know, maybe he he, he uh, you know he's probably going to inherit this lot, so he might take it down and drive it. It's his name on there. Yeah, oh, yeah Michael okay. Michael Landon. Oh. Yeah. Um, we got a N1 R34 here. Yeah. Uh, this belongs to a friend that you know, Andrew. Yes. Yeah. Yes. Uh, so that's being stored because I, I've got I, I bought an R32 N1 off Andrew, and that's currently uh, with a mechanic getting some more horsepower. So. This, uh, this is currently being looked after for Ant on Andrew's behalf. I think. Yeah, okay, so this is the one that I've driven before. Yeah, yeah, that's yeah. right. Yeah, 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 I've driven this one. Yeah. And uh, if you guys want to see the video of all the N1s together at GTR Fest from um, just a couple months ago, go check that out. Hmm. But um, so this is, the, this is the only car here that's not your car. Yes, yeah. yeah. But this is your car. That's my car. TME, I've never seen a blue one. Uh, only 430 blue ones ever made. Uh, it's called Canal Blue. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously everybody wants a red. I like red, but I kind of like blue too. <laughs> I, I think the blue is cool because yeah. I've seen so many of the red ones. Yeah, you know, if you can ever get one, I mean, I, I, I know the kind of cars you like, you'd love to drive it. They, to me, they're more fun than the, the R32. They're more nimble and just as quick. Um, there'd be very few modern, uh, you know, um, sports car strokes, supercars that could keep up in the twisty roads with these. Yeah, the, this, these are so much fun. We're, we're driving a, um, a wagon. Our, our friend Joe from Cars from Japan is letting us drive his mm. uh, Evo wagon. And uh, I kind of get a little bit of essence that it is such a fun car to drive. I mean, it has so much power. Yeah. And it's just so much fun to drive a manual vehicle around. Yeah, you know, yeah. that has so much space. But this... This is like a dream car. This is so cool. It, it, it just, it just has that essence, you know, from that era. I to to totally agree, and uh, you know, I, I think they should be becoming eligible to be imported to the states. Yeah, very soon. And, uh, so this is uh, what, what year is this one? Oh, you got me. Uh, ninety nine. Ninety nine. I think. Uh, I, I mean, yeah, if 99. it's a 99, then it'll be legal very early next year. Yeah. 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 I think it's a 99. I, yeah. I, I struggle to remember all the exact years, but yeah. I think it's a, around the 99, yeah. Can we take a look at the hood under, yeah, under, yeah, the, sure. under the yeah. bonnet? Um, this, is, uh, this is pretty well a standard car. So then it's interesting to me because some of your cars you modify heavily. Yeah. And some of your cars you like to keep standard. Look, I'm a, a car lover of all types of cars. I mean, if you look on the wall, they're all, all cars that I've had, you know, uh, minis, uh, Porsches, 
I was heavily into Lotus. I at one stage actually represented Lotus Motorsport here in Australia for, for race cars. But the, the theme mostly, not so much the Porsche, but the Mini and the Lotus is, is, is lightweight, nimble, nice handling cars. So that's, that's my preference. But, you know, I like, I like everything. I, like, I haven't ever, never owned a hot rod, but I like, you know, certain hot rods. You know, some of the uh, American, you know, the old 50s and 60s cars I, I like. There's not much that I don't like. If you boil it down, you know, I like the nimble cars. In terms of, uh, I don't go outright to modify. I mean, if a car's standard, for example, you know, like that NSX or like this, I'm not going to go and modify for bulk horsepower or whatever. I, I, I like the way it is. <laughs> what yeah. a play. Yeah. <laughs> you have all the good plays. <laughs> I'm surprised, you know. It's, I, I was surprised I could get it because, I mean, uh, yeah. yeah. I can't, I, this is, it's in such good condition too. Yeah, and this, so, this, this has done a hundred and... What is it? No, 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 no not, not yet 100,000 Ks. I think about, um, but it's close to something like 90,000 Ks. So did you buy this in Australia or did yeah, you import yeah. this? No, I bought it here. Um, I bought it off a guy who, he had a genuine reason for selling it. He was a Porsche guy and he wanted to buy a Porsche Cup car. Talked to him and, uh, I, you know, again, a car lover. It was in South Australia. I had a mate look at it, the test drove it, and it all sacked up. So yeah, I've had no 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 trouble. It it uh, it came with the original wheels, which uh, uh, somebody said they're worth about ten grand now. These are the wheels that came on it, uh, which are I think one inch larger than standard. Um, got nice sticky Yokohama rubber, so there's no reason to change it. I had those refurbed, and uh, so they sit there along with the original NSX wheels. Uh, yeah, so um, yeah, there we go. Normally, uh, I keep them all on trickle charges, but I tidied it up for you coming along. <laughs> I appreciate it. Thank you so much. Uh, Next to it is yeah. something that I've only seen at the Zama collection in um, yep. in Yokohama yep. Yep. Um, at Nissan's collection. Yeah. I, I've only seen one there. So what's the story with this? Okay. So if we go back again, uh, I think there's interesting information. Well, I'll try and keep it short, but if you go back... You got to look at Japan after the war, you know, emerging, um, you know, really hard times and so on and so forth. So fast forward to the 60s where the economy is starting to get going. From memory, I think it was 1963 was the first uh, Japanese Grand Prix and Prince uh, were a manufacturer in their own right. They started off, they were making aircraft during the war, but they went to making cars after the war. But there was a lot of technology. So in 63, they got trounced with the car they put in. So they said, we, we've got to build a car that we can go racing with. So they had a one and a half litre Skyline. And, and by the way, that's where the uh, Skyline comes from. It doesn't come from Nissan, it comes from Prince. And so they took the one and a half litre car, which looked like this, and they added 200 mil to the front guard so that they could fit their six cylinder motor in it. And they put the six cylinder motor in it, which is this, two litre, tuned it up. What you see here is exactly how it came from factory with uh, triple Weber carburetors, five speed gearbox, 100 litre fuel tank uh, with a, a churn fill, disc brake front end, limited slip diff, um, all stuff that, and this is uh, 19, this, this car is 67. This is right at the point where the government, Japanese government, said to the small manufacturers that they needed to amalgamate with big manufacturers to uh, make the, really to prevent foreign takeovers. Prince didn't want to amalgamate with Nissan, but they were forced to. But it was Nissan's win because all that racing technology was uh, acquired by uh, Nissan. And the engineers from Prince, they designed this car and in 60, in the Japanese Grand Prix in 64, uh, the, the Prince came second through to sixth place. And they were only beaten by a 904 Porsche, uh, which was a late entry. And at one stage during that race, a driver called Ikuzawa, who is very famous, raced in Europe, he actually took the lead from the 904. And you can imagine the crowd in Japan just went berserk. Unfortunately, the Porsche overtook him, but he, he uh, then ended up third, and a guy, Sunako, who is also very famous, uh, came second in a, in a Prince. So then what uh, Prince did from there, in 65, uh, they didn't have a Grand Prix. I don't, I don't remember the reason. But for 65, Prince said, OK, we need to build something like the Porsche 904. So they built a, a car called the uh, R380, which is an absolutely beautiful-looking car. It's, it's something like the 904 exquisite car and uh, they they built a new engine a twin cam g8 engine and in in 1966 they won they won the, the japanese grand prix so that's the that's the origins of japanese real japanese motorsport and you know how keen the japanese are on all kinds of motorsport so 
Prince um, is absolute heroes, and that technology, the, the engineer in particular, who's in the Japanese Hall of Fame, a guy called Sakurai san, he, he had input all the way through up, and, up to and including the R32. So, but yeah, it's, it's a very significant car. And, and then this is kind of like where you, yeah. you the GT badge comes from, yeah, which yeah. is, you know, which was on all the way up to the 34. Yeah. Uh, what, how did you even get this? Like, where did you find this? <laughs> okay. If you're not sick of stories, when I was um, 18, I worked a, a Christmas job at the end of school and I saved up some money. Uh, my mother never had got her license and she got a license at 50 years of age. So I had some money and I thought, okay, I'm gonna buy her her first car. So the car I bought her was a Prince GTB. And back in the day, it was $1,800, which was quite a lot of money, but uh, it was secondhand. But Australia was the only country to get some princes. Back in the day, we got 300. Don't ask me why, but quite a lot of, you're probably aware, quite a lot of Japanese cars, uh, unusual cars, came to Australia um, over the years. So the reason to buy it is so that I could drive it as well. But she, she drove it for about 15 years and she'd come home and saying how she could drag everybody away from the lights uh, in this bridge. She loved it. And, and her, her next and last car was actually a Datsun too, but that's another story. So uh, there was that family history, if you like, in that story. And I, I loved the car back then. So when I started to collect Japanese cars, I thought, you know, Prince was always on the radar. Now, those 300 cars that came to Australia are mostly non-existent. It's estimated there might be 50, and most of them are in poor condition. But I was looking, and they just don't come up. They're not advertised, so you've got to know somebody who knows somebody. Anyway, there's a little bit of a story, but anyway, I'll cut it short. As luck would have it, I was introduced to a guy. It wasn't on the market. We hit it off, and we did a deal. And um, Oh, so it was in Australia? It was in Australia, oh. and he, he restored it. But he'd, he'd also had one new. He's, he's actually three years older than me. Um, he keeps asking me if I'd sell it back to him. But there's another little strange story I'll tell you quickly. A couple of years ago, I bought a, a Ballet GTR, which is also very rare. Twin cam uh, Ballet, which was made for racing as well. 1,400 uh, uh, ever made. Japanese have told me they don't think there's any more than 600 left. Uh, there's only one um, Series 2 GTR in Australia, but no genuine uh, twin cam one. So I bought it. I started the restoration. I just got sick of doing the resto. Got went about halfway, and John, who I bought this off, he said I, I, I was going to take a dip, you know. And I, so I took the I took the uh, the dip price. I sold it to John. He's now completed it. So I'm really happy, and that you know we've become firm friends. So mm. he's he's got the I've got his prints. And he's got my Valencia. That's so gun. funny. And <laughs> you you know you're doing something right when you're buying these cars that are so special. Yeah. At, that people want back. You know, yeah. <laughs> they're yeah. like special to you, special to other people, and you know, special yeah. to people like myself too, because I understand how incredible this collection is and then what it means to people like yourself. Well, that, that's really nice, uh, Larry. I, frankly, uh, I'm, I'm not really any good at making money on cars. Some, some people are, but my driving force is really the, the like of the car and the passion. You know, I made probably a few dollars, but like, you know, sadly the 22B, I sold it for less than I paid. And you know, that's, there was only one Australian delivered one has ever been on the market. And that was in the last year or so. And they were asking $800,000 for it. And one recently sold, uh, Colin McRae's one, you're probably aware, sold for well over a million. So anyway, that was a bird that escaped, but I did enjoy it. <laughs> At least you used it as your daily driver. And yeah, you can say that you used a 22B yeah. as your daily. Yeah. I, 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 I'd love to show you the photo that appeared this, this very day. I'm, yeah. Uh, so it, I just want to take a look at the inside of yeah, this yeah, because look. it's, it's, it looks like I it's mean, in incredible condition, yeah, huh? I mean, you've got to think this is 1967. Um, and, and, you know, the, the quality that they were producing, you know, uh, Speedo, Taco, uh, Heater, um, no, no aircon, but, you know, look at the upholstery. Uh, that's, that's all how it was. Um, it's crazy to me because so much of this reminds me of the Hako and of the 240Z. Yeah. You know, a lot of it transferred over. Yeah, absolutely. Well, the the Hako was actually designed by Prince, uh, both the four-door and the two-door. That was a Prince design. Um, so, yeah, this this carried over. And, um, you know, the 510 Datsun, you, if you look at this rear window line, uh, you can see the, where the 510 Datsun came from. Yeah, it is. It, yeah. Definitely, yeah. exactly. You can see that without a doubt. Yeah. Huh. So how often do you, oh, how often do you get to drive this? 
this one, um, it, it, it sort of depends what's on. The, we, we, we have a Japanese uh, show on every year up at Newcastle, and I, I tend to take this up. Uh, you recall I had it at the GDR Festival, so that was the last time I drove it, but, you know, probably four or five times a year. It's, you know, it's an oldie, it's in good, it's in good condition, and, you know, I, I keep them maintained, but, um, you know, it's, it's just a lot easier to get into the more, more modern stuff. The Z, there's no, no reason, I mean, I, I don't keep them mothballs, but it just depends what's on, you know, it's sort of time, place, occasion type sort of thing, so. And then your, the last car that you have uh -huh. in this shed yeah. is... Something that I've never seen before. This is also very near and dear to my heart. You know, I have a 350Z or Z as you guys call them. Yeah. But this one is the most special version. This is a homologation special um, 380RS. Yeah. Uh, yes, I'm speechless. <laughs> I, I've, so I've only seen, I've seen two. Okay, so I've seen one other one here in Australia that was cruising around with us. Yeah. I didn't understand, I didn't see, I thought it was just a Nismo. Yeah. You know, I was like, oh, that's cool, whatever. I did see one yeah. um, at Zama, yeah. um, at Nissan, but I've never seen one in person up close. I've never had a chance to touch it and look at it and see what's different. But um, I know these are just so special and there's just not that many that exist. And we never got them in the US also. No, Yeah. no. Um that, that's uh, one of the things about, and you would have discovered in Australia, you know, I, I think a lot of Americans are saying, well, you know, how come all these cars, you know, the 32, 33, 30, how come they're all in Australia? I think it goes back to the era of, you know, right back to the beginning. I mean, in the early 50s, I remember Toyota. Everybody laughed. They brought the Toyota Tiara, which was a funny looking little car. I mean, the first Japanese cars were pretty you know, ordinary. But we have a long history and with quite a few interesting models like the Prince coming and, and that sort of is almost in the, uh, the DNA of, of, of uh, particularly young guys. I mean, like me back then to have a car, you know, uh, uh, triple carburetors, disc brakes, five-speed gearbox. I mean, that was all mind-boggling back in the 60s. And as you're aware with the 32s, 33s, people, the Aussies just love them. And uh, I wasn't aware of these either until the one that you saw, I saw, and I thought, wow, that's, that's a nice car. And so I thought, well, I need to get one. So then this one's 173. Yeah, 173. They were going to make 300, but they only made 260. And That's it? Yeah, 260 and only 60 in black. The three colors were uh, white, silver, and black. White is the most common. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think uh, black was uh, 60 or 61. This is, this is, I, I had no idea it was only 260. Yeah. I cannot believe how much these are going for now. They're just so expensive. Well, yeah, I mean, compared to the, the 350 for sure. Um, but as you know, I mean, this is a 3.8 3 litre motor and it's all forged internals, board and stroke, uh, the homologation special for the race cars. So, and you get all the extra goodies like Yamaha suspension and um, yeah, so the, and, and obviously, uh, uh, bespoke front front lip rear spoiler um, you know a few Nismo features inside and uh, as you said uh, it's not like the, the the Nismo Z as you call them uh, this is actually a car that went through and was built by Nismo so it's similar to say Z tune or you know so that's the, the significant thing and that's but it, it's interesting actually Larry because um, price wise they're really only fetching about what they sold for back in the day mm. so I actually think uh, and that's partly what motivated me. I think they're actually good value uh, right yeah. now. Um, so how does it drive? H have you driven the yeah. standard version? Uh, no, no, I haven't driven the standard version. So I can't really give you that comparison, but I did have somebody in who knew both cars and they said, oh, you know, this is totally different. That the, the motor revs out, you know, um, and you know, it's pretty talky. I can't tell you handling wise. I, I um, uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's pleasant. I, I, um, I would still call it a GT Cruiser. Mm -hmm. uh, rather, uh, you know, I mean, it's 15 years old. Um, it's got, it, it's fun to drive because, you know, it's not overpowering. The handling is nice. Uh, yeah, I, I like it. I, frankly, I, I bought it with a view to, you know, um, selling it at some point, but I, I kind of like it. So it's probably- <laughs> I like it too. It's, it's, <laughs> it's, it's cool. It's special enough, you know, because yeah. it makes more power than the 370, which yeah. was the generation that came after. Yeah. Um, and this was, uh, correct me if I'm wrong, it was homologated for Super Taikyu yes, that's in right. Japan. Yeah. So that way they could run this 3.8 liter 
yeah. you know, a hot motor that's right. in, in that series. Yeah. Yeah, no, that's exactly right. It's, it's, just, it's just special enough. I, I, even the interior, yeah. you know, there's certain bits that yeah. make it special, you know, like the, the different trim. So then well, I, I got to just... Seat covers back if you want to have a look at the seats. It's a, there's little the features gauges. here. The gauges. Can I just turn this on real quick? Yeah. Sure. Oh, the, oh, does that not... Doesn't light up. Well, maybe, maybe, it does, maybe it only lights up with a key. Yeah, maybe. It smells like a new car. <laughs> it has no, it must not have that many kilometers. No, 65,000 Ks, which is, what would that be? Maybe you know, off the rough guess, 40,000 miles. I can't believe how clean the door panels, yeah, all the yeah. little things. Yeah, I, I, I lucked out really. Um, I bought it, you know, through the, through the auctions. Um, but it's, yeah, it's in really nice, nice. Oh, so you bought it? In Japan. In Japan. Yeah. yeah. Oh. Um, well, yeah, so I, I put the wheels on. I, I can show you the original wheels, and I I did the catback exhaust. It's a, you wouldn't be able to tell, but it just gave it that nice little note. This is so cool. Little Altec badge. Yeah, yeah, and uh, you know these are obviously distinctly fairly easy and uh, and, of, and of course you have such a cool plate again <laughs> yeah <laughs> i don't know how i do them but I, you know i figure if you think hard enough and long enough you're going to find that something that's you know could, could work yeah and now and then you know you hit the jackpot jackpot i love it and it, i i don't know I, i'm assuming that the nismo didn't have the two-tone no um from what i can tell that's special yeah because it's it's the rear bumper side skirts yeah, I can show you. Obviously, the Allen GT4s—they—they uh, only—they're only they they only they are only available in black. I—I I, uh, painted them gold, and they, well, I had a guy do it, but he's done an incredible job because that's that's actually like engraved in there. Oh yeah, that and looks you, great. You, you can imagine. So he's actually managed to block all that out, and the original stickers he's masked those, so it really looks. Uh, once upon a time, you could get them in in bronze, but uh, I just thought the black and bronze was uh, you know a nice combination. This is just a such a special vehicle very 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 cool and th what's also cool about this is if you're just driving on the road people wouldn't even know no. that it's special they no. just will overlook it they think that it's just another 350 another 350 that's right yeah huh what's going on with this engine here ah <laughs> you're asking these uh, uh, it's very hard to give you short answers so um where do i start I used to have a Ken Mary Tribute as well, which I, I sold last year to a friend. And this is the motor that was in that car when I bought it. Now, a guy, the same guy who did my Hacker restoration, that's how I met him. He, he restored this, uh, it was a 240K, which was a two door Ken Mary style. Uh, he didn't have the um, guts, if you like, he didn't want to cut the guards and all that. I mean, it is a shame to do it, but he did a full resto. I came in when the car was looking immaculate, but in original condition. And I said, okay, I'll buy it, but I want to do the GRT, uh, G, GTR tribute. So I bought all, you know, all the flares and everything like that. We cut the guards and so on and so forth. So this engine is basically pretty standard. So I wasn't happy with that. So what happened was in the Hacko, as I, I mentioned, I put a, a, a race motor in there. The motor out of the Hacko, I, uh, we, uh, we, we breathed on that as well, not not to the extent of the hacker, and then I put that in the Ken Mary. So this became surplus. Mm, yeah, so, so are you just saving it for a future build? Yeah, well, maybe, but it, you, you know, uh, it's it's got uh, it's got the Solex carbies on it, which were on the original Hacko. So yeah, that, 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 that's that's probably good. But the, you know, you'd have to. It's not not worth really a lot of money. It's it's just good decoration, but like just this scene right here. Yeah. It's like, so what country am I in? Yeah. <laughs> you know? well, and, and it's a fridge. Of <laughs> it's a nice fridge. <laughs> uh, thank you so much for showing us your collection. This is so cool. Oh, Incredible you, collection. Loved, it's been lovely to have you here. Yeah, it, it is um, like you're just... It, it's it's I wouldn't say it's all over the place, but it's still focused on a certain kind of car. It's just a driver car. Yeah. Maybe a lot of car enthusiasts, if they see any of these vehicles, they would maybe besides the NSX, they would just, you know, it would just go over their head. They wouldn't Possibly. even understand yeah. what it is. Yeah. And that, that's what I like about this collection. Oh, yeah. You know, thank it's you. it's yeah. all special cars if you're into cars. Yeah. And particularly if you're into JDM, which you yeah, are. So. Of course. Of course. <laughs> all right. Um, that's a 22B. Oh, this is your. Yeah, that was my Oh, car. no. <laughs> 
<laughs> it's the uh, colors fade a little bit. Uh, yeah. yeah. At least you have a yeah some memory a memory of it. of it. Yeah. Do you know where the car is now? The guy saw that write up in the magazine, and he swore that if ever came up for sale, he'd buy it. And he, he, he I don't know what he had to he probably had to sell his mother to get it. Um, <laughs> not that it was, you know, looking back, it wasn't a lot of money. But uh, as far as I know. I know roughly where he comes from. He's a, he was a miner in like out towards Central Australia. So as far as I know, he's probably still got it. And um, thanking the day that he bought it. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Thank you so much. Hey, thanks for watching. If you want to support us directly, go to LarryChenPrints.com. I print and sign every single one of these. This is the perfect gift, or it's the perfect piece of art for your wall.